Well, welcome back to another one here on Chasing Green. Today we got Jonathan Morton from Echo Duck Calls, and I'm so excited for this dude. Jonathan is an excellent caller, one of the best duck callers in the world. He's got seven top five finishes, twice finished runner up not only is he a great competition caller but he also teaches the calling classes here at echo so he's taught a lot of duck callers he sees a lot of mistakes and he's got a lot of great advice if you're looking to take that next level as a duck caller you're going to want to watch this one so jonathan being a teacher of a lot of people trying to learn how to blow duck calls what's the number one mistake you see guys making i would say the number one mistake would be over grunting majority of people pick up a call trying to produce a sound that sounds like a duck the natural thing that people do is automatically put a bunch of grunt into it to get the sound to come out close to a duck because if they're not putting too much grunt into it it's not going to sound anything remotely like a duck it's going to be high pitched because they just don't know how to operate the call when they first get it so that grunt i mean what's that do what are they achieving by doing that well it gets the reed vibrating so when they push the air into the call it will not lock up or squeeze down on you. But at the same time, it puts you in a rut because whenever you're grunting, you're squeezing your throat down. So that's causing another issue that we'll talk about later. But it puts you in that rut and you can only, you can't get soft on the call. Most people who grunt are, are loud and they, they just can't get soft to call on the call soft to get ducks to come in. They're the same and they're monotone. Yeah, I, I went through this myself as a young duck caller. How do you counter that? What's the fix to, to grunting? If you over grunt currently, you need to turn the call around backwards. So you're, you're grunting like into the call, you wanna turn it around backwards because <coughs> you're gonna hear yourself. Yeah. Okay, so you wanna completely get rid of it. And at some point, you're gonna wanna put a little bit of a short grunt back into it but if you're over grunt, you want to completely get away from it until it's not habit anymore. Typically, people who over grunt, grunt through the note the whole time. So, <laughs> like that. So when you're blowing the call correctly with the right amount of grunt, you have a little bitty grunt right at the beginning of the note. And all that does is get the reed starting to vibrate. So when the air comes in and, and hits it, it keeps it, you know, it's already moving, so it's not going to lock down. Yeah. So uh, this is exact hot air and just a short grunt how the call should sound when you're blowing correctly. <laughs> it's just right at the beginning of the note, <laughs> but not like this. <laughs> you talked about getting rid of the grunt and replacing that, fixing that by hot air. How do you achieve that hot air? How do you get that? It's a complicated one. Some people can get it pretty fast. Uh, the thing that I have seen, the people who have been calling the wrong way longest tend to be the hardest ones to break the old habits. Uh, so if a new caller comes in and never picked up a call, I can usually have that caller in my class blowing better in two weeks than people that's been coming for two years that have been blowing 10 years the wrong way. How do you get them started? What do you tell them to get started on hot air? Once you get rid of the grunt, so then we'll start getting into the hot air and you're basically bringing the air up from your diaphragm and just oh, fog a window. Just visualize fogging a window. That's hot air. <laughs> just practice and <laughs> to clean air. Just clean hot air. And the, hot air, the hotter the air you put into the call, the better the sound. So hot air comes from basically relaxing your throat. Okay. So a lot of people... <clears throat> they try to use their throat to call and they grunt that's and it's pinched down and the grunt compensates for the pinched throat because if they're didn't over grunt and they push that air into the call it's automatically going to lock yeah so you you want to take the throat completely out of it absolutely okay. you want all the uh shutting off of the notes the control of the call to be done with the very end of your tongue jonathan probably don't remember this but when i was a lot younger the biggest change in my duck hunting Duck, duck calling technique came from him. I came to the old Echo shop and you told me that. You said, fog the window. That's what you got. You listen to me blow and, and I thought I was good. You know, I was Mr. <laughs> Bad. But he sat me down real quick and showed me what I was doing wrong and it was awesome. It was the biggest change. So fogging that window, that metaphor, that thought process really fixed my duck calling. And you know, it's even to this day, I'm one of those guys who blew the wrong way for a long time. I started blowing duck call when I was two years old. So I had 15 years of the wrong way. Working on that and getting that hot air by acting like you're fogging a window, just trying to get that hot air out. 
um, once you get that, it will change everything for sure. I, I'm guilty of it too. When I first started coming to Rick's calling class back in 2007, I think it was, I thought I was an awesome duck caller. Yeah. <laughs> I found out real quick <laughs> I was not. Yeah. So you talked about taking the throat completely out, but correct me if I'm wrong, you, you can use the throat later to manipulate sound, right? Right. So once you get more control and your mechanics correct on the call you can go back to using your throat because i use my throat so you you st start doing the whines and squeals or getting real soft you do pinch your throat down but it takes control and knowing what you're doing in order to get that otherwise you know you're back at square one so just as far as getting range and getting different tones and pitches run through what it takes to get the different tones and pitches, like what you need to get a low sound versus a high sound versus a raspy sound versus a clean sound. How does all that work as far as what you're doing? So a lot of, to get deeper, of course it's hotter air and less air pressure. That's gonna give you the deeper sound. So more air pressure and not as hot of air will give you higher pitch sound. And then as far as raspy or more raspy, you know, the same thing, the lower, the, uh, the hotter the air, the deeper the sound's gonna be and a little bit more rasp. And a lot of that can be controlled with where your hand positioning is as far as the rasp. Really? So op more open, it's gonna be raspier. And you know, the more you enclose it in and create back pressure, the less it's gonna be raspy. So how are you creating that back pressure? It just, because your exhaust is here. So right now, if you was to blow into the call, there's nothing restricting it. So when you put your hand up there, even just like that, you're already restricting some sound and air pressure. Yeah. So when you bring your hand in some, it's more and more, you know what I'm saying? It'll get to the point it's muffled. And even if you're blowing high air into call, you can't blow it right if you get too far in. So the more you choke it down, the more- Mellow it's gonna get. Less raspy, mm -hmm. okay. Some people, you know, will hold the call like this and when you're starting out calling because you have no control over your air, your mechanics, it, it's really bad. So it's actually better to keep your hand basically like this saluting when you're beginning to learn how to call too because your mechanics ain't right and your back pressure, you can't, I mean, it's just way simpler and you're gonna get up the road faster if you have your hand completely out of the way when you're first calling. So get everything in order first in your air, your throat, your tongue, and yep. then bring in the hand last. Yeah, then you can start you know, using your hand some to manipulate back pressure and, and, and that stuff once you've got your mechanics correct. What about your tongue? What, what should it be doing? It should basically be pressed as far as shutting off the notes, it should be the very quarter end of your tongue should be up against the roof of your mouth by where your gum line of your teeth, front teeth are. Kind of bent just a little bit to where you're using not the very tip of it, but about a quarter back, or at least that's the way I use mine. So we've kind of talked about increasing your range on the duck call, increasing your ability to do certain things. Another big part of that, in my opinion, is having a single read. So, so how important is a single read to becoming a better duck caller? It's very important because a single read is going to give you the most range that you can get out of a call. And you're going to have less issues. So anytime you got two reads, you got two places for moisture, two places for it to freeze, you know, when it gets cold. Whereas you got one read and it's, it's just got a lot more travel the read does instead of when it, you got two, they don't travel as much. So blowing a single reed's where you want to be, for sure. If you're a beginner, I recommend always going with a double reed because typically a person buys a double reed, they typically won't develop the overgrunting habit because a double reed, you don't really have to put correct air into it. You get a pretty good sound out of just putting air into that thing. So I would recommend going that way with a, you know, a beginner is getting a double reed. I haven't seen near as many people as you, but one common thing that I see uh, people that can't take that next step is they're just simply not practicing enough. Oh yeah. It's like they just don't put the time in on a call. I don't think they realize how much time it takes. When you went from being that okay duck caller, you duck hunted a while to that next level, you know, champion or competition calling guy that you are now, what was your, what did your practice routine look like back then and how often were you practicing? On average, and this is, I'm not being crazy, I probably practice when I, the first year I started competition calling, probably a minimum of four hours a day. Four hours a day. And I, and the, the key to also getting better is always record yourself, listen back, and give yourself time to hear 
and li record someone or have a video of someone blowing the duck call correctly and compare yourself to them and try to make yourself better every time you record. I couldn't tell you how many times or how many routines I've recorded over the years. I still record them to this day. What else would you do? What was your practice day look like? First of all, as far as the hell calls, which that's where you're trying to get really open, so I would really just blow one and hold it and try to visualize fog in the window the whole time I'm holding the note, try to get it as open as I could and as deep a sound as I could. So the, the deeper, the, the hotter air you put into it and the more th open throat, the deeper the sound. So I just always was trying to get my hell call to ring really loud but also to be deep and open because it actually whenever it gets deeper the sound is actually louder than if it's you know high pitch sure which is why our bible mm. is cut, cut downs now yeah yeah <laughs> or that's the argument anyway. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i think for, just in my opinion that applies to everybody you know he was doing it trying to get into the competition side of things with that hell call but in my experience tell me if you agree with this once you get the loud and you get the range on the call as far as the top end being able to really get down on it and really do those loud calls it makes everything so much easier even oh, on the yeah. low end of the scale you oh, get yeah. so much more control in every aspect yeah. of your duck calling yeah and i always tell people that learn how to make that thing sing that's yep. what you need to do yeah and you want to be on top of the call quick because if you can control your air and you have all your mechanics right when you first take off on the note that's going to give you so much control down the road like that's i have people in calling class all the time they ease into their note i'm like you want to be on top of it because that means you are controlling everything is right when you put the air into the call yeah and that's actually one of my biggest weaknesses that first note is not like the rest it's hard i don't have the acceleration or yeah, the you yeah. know that I don't have that punch in the first one, mm -hmm. and I really have to get it going later. Yeah. So you, when you were doing your routine, you would basically just run through a cadence over oh, and over yeah. and over. Yeah. Oh yeah. I would when I was doing my competition routine. So I would do hell calls. I'd practice on them for probably thirty minutes until I kind of got tired. So then when I got tired, I would go to just my ducks, my cadences, because they don't take near the pressure. You know, you're not on the top end of the call, and if you on the top in the call and you're blowing too long, you'll start to develop bad habits from being tired. So it's good to transition and segment. You know, then I'd work on the feed call and I'd do that every day. How long what should the average guy practice? That's a good time. Just a duck hunter, probably maybe 30 minutes a day. It, you know, if they're trying to actually advance their skill, probably 30 minutes a day during the summertime, you know, up until starting the summer and up until duck season. Yeah. Talking about the whole call and stuff though, Another key as far as the duck hunting part is way more important than the calling. That's w reading the ducks and when to call and when not to call. And that just takes time or hunting with people that know what they're doing already. It's all about body language, wing beat is super key, and just watching them heads. I mean, where are they looking, you know? Yeah. And how they're reacting to the call is like huge. Yeah, I mean, a huge part of it is just paying attention to what you're doing. A lot of guys just blow the same yeah. thing over and over, and they're not they're not looking at how the ducks are reacting to it. Yeah, they're just calling. You know, I mean, for me, there's a lot of days where say like the feed call just absolutely turns them off. Yeah, like, they don't want well, it. There's days. Like, yeah. and if you keep blowing it over and over, <laughs> you're gonna yeah. the same result. <laughs> yeah, like. Being able to see that it's negatively impacting the ducks oh, is yeah. huge. Yeah. But I agree, it's all about reading the ducks and blowing at the right time. I mean, I can't tell you how many people that I thought just yeah. sounded terrible. You know, they're calling in ducks all day because yeah. they're blowing at the right time. And any more used to it would be seasonal. Like first of season, you know, the ducks would be pretty callable and not yeah. call. And, you know, mid-season, they're getting a little, but now it's like a day-to-day -day basis with ducks. Yeah. I mean, almost sometimes group to group. One of the biggest things that stood out watching those old Echo videos, like the first few years you got started, Mallard Madness 6 or 7 up through there, y'all got to the point on public ground where you just had so many good callers. I mean, mm. you were running traffic like mm. I'd never seen traffic ground yeah. before. I mean, it gives me chill bumps just to think about it because oh. that impacted me so hard. I just remember there for a while, Rick would say in the intro is, if we see them, we're going to get them. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had a monopoly on them for a while because we was kind of the only ones doing that at the time, you know. And then, of course, our videos and people started like, hey, let's get more callers together and stuff. Yeah. But, yeah, man, we would have people just to, to talk about, set up, come and set up on a hole real close to us. 
you know, and if it was two or three of us, it would have been a, a competition, but with us having the, the caliber of callers that we had and caliber of hunters we had, you know, it was like, oh, that's fine. Just let them set up there. That's fine. They, yeah. they watch a show, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd never seen anybody do it like that. I mean, it was mind-blowing to me, and, and I've took that all over the country, not to that extent because you it's hard to get that many people yeah but it's so effective even just five or six of you or four or five i mean it's it can make a huge difference man oh yeah so explain to me how you guys came on to this what it, <sighs> the, what the process was of getting better at it the thing is if you go listen to a raft of ducks just observe them and it's just constant noise the whole time i mean you're trying to be as real listic as possible so if you just observe ducks in a in a middle of the day just going down the timber just rafting up it's just non-stop and just non-stop water splashing i mean it's non-stop noise so if you try to replicate that it produces more ducks because they get interested you know they hear the same two or three people calling all over the state yeah. And then you get to this one spot where it's just, it just sounds like a raft of ducks, and it it works. And talk about how much it works. Like, <laughs> how far are these ducks y'all can break them? Uh, I, I don't know. I've seen them to where they're like, there's one hunt that I refer to as like, it's ingrained, like the go big or go That's home. That's exactly the one I was going to tell people to go watch. There was hardly any ducks in the area at the time. There were some ducks holding up north and a cold front come through. It's kind of windy anyway, and, and they were migrating ducks. So the area we were actually hunting didn't have a lot of ducks. But we were short stopping these ducks headed down south. And there was groups of 50 and 60 at a time, and I'm, I'm talking when you could barely see some of them. And we'd get to well and kick and water, you know, and just two turns and that's in. That's, that's the exact video I was going to mention. If you want to see this running traffic that I'm talking about at its best, go watch on Echo's uh, YouTube channel. I'll link it down below in the description. Go big or go home. Oh. It's 13 or 15 of these guys just blowing, and they're pulling ducks. I mean, they're shooting into... 30 or 40 mallards at a time, 50 oh, it's, mallards. It's, and it's I mean, they killed like a 15 man limit, something like that. It was insane. I think there were 17 of us there. 17, I 17 think, yeah. man mallard limit on public ground, yeah, Arkansas it, it, Timber. It's one of the best public land videos I've ever seen. Yeah, and that's another thing about calling as a team. So if we had people that would just join us or we got to the same hole and like, you know, don't want to compete with them, you know, you hunt with us. So we had a thing that First, if you see something working and start working the hole or, or working us, hit the feed call. Immediately follow. If somebody hits the feed call, that's the signal that something's trying to work, you know, work us or come in. So everybody else follows suit, get softer. You know, that way you're not blowing somebody calling in a group of ducks over here and blowing these out of the hole. Because once you get two or three committed, especially if there's ducks up in the sky, you know, you get some ducks working. You know how that works. Follow the leader type deal. Yeah. So, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah. That's good stuff. So you would like explain this before daylight. Oh yeah, yeah. And you would say but, when you hear a feed call, lay off. Yeah, yeah. So we're not telling you how to call or, or when to call, but if you know when we hunt, this is how we do it, and we, you know it's pretty uh, successful. So as soon as you, whoever is in the group, sees the first group lock up or start to commit. Go to the feed call just you know so everybody knows quit welling you know yeah that's a good system so going from that to what your average person is going to be able to do what do you got for man i only hunt with two or three guys what can we do uh, well you need to get the primo hole for one you know you need to go where they want to be at <laughs> so <laughs> that would be key. that goes for everything but i mean if you got two or three guys you know uh, and you can't really well on them as much with two or three guys. I, I don't know why, but it don't really work as good, you know. Uh, sometimes it seems like it scares them more than anything. I, I don't know. You know, and, and the other thing that wasn't that in it, it's not just the call and everybody kicking water, too. You know, that loud noise of the kicking of the water, kind of like replicating all of them, jumping around, splashing, you know. 
all that water movement and sound also with that many guys helps too. Sure. I'm giving away too many secrets. No, that's that's what we want here. <laughs> well, Jonathan, I appreciate you coming on. I mean, this was just an honor to sit here and talk to one of the greatest duck callers in the country. So I'm just a duck hunter. I mean, you've impacted me probably more than you know, uh, just through watching the video and the short few times I've talked to you a long time ago. I mean, it had a huge impact. So hopefully it impacts some of you guys. He's, he's a great guy to learn from. Uh, he had, he runs the Echo YouTube channel, so be sure and check it out. They've got a lot of hunts on it, calling tips, tips on which calls to buy, acrylic versus wood, all that kind of stuff. So I will link their channel down below. I highly recommend you can follow Jonathan on Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. And man, I just appreciate it, and thanks hey, for coming I, on, I, man. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. We'll catch you next time, Lord willing, right here on Chasing Green.